greatest flood in American history was upon us. We did not see our lands again for four months. Will Percy, 1927. A rolling giant sea covered 26,000 square miles of the Mississippi Valley, inundating parts of seven states and forcing half a million people from their homes. The system of levees designed to hold back the river had failed. Unlike the barren Colorado, the Mississippi is lush and inviting but it is difficult to control and impossible to predict. Its bed was not etched from rock, but set in sand and clay, its muddy course changing almost whimsically. The largest river in North America, the lower Mississippi is the main stem of a 15,000 mile system that drains nearly half the continental United States into the Gulf of Mexico. As soon as the French began settling New Orleans in the early part of the 18th century, levees were thrown up to provide flood control. And it was common knowledge that for anyone to live within the alluvial valley of the uh, Mississippi River, levees would have to be built. The people who lived along the river were responsible for constructing the levees themselves and the early levees were six feet to nine feet high, so that if you granted the land along the river to agricultural users, it was in their best interest to construct the levee, and they had to maintain the levee as well. However, these early levees were not reliable. Great floods frequently came that devastated this more primitive levee system and a kind of pall of dread and fear hung over the valley for many centuries. Local officials begged Washington for help. And in 1917, the federal government ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to take action. The Corps had developed a philosophy and an approach to flood control that levees only were the way to control the Mississippi, that the great floods could be passed to the Gulf of Mexico through these structures. It took 10 years for the Corps to complete the levees only project. The new levees were 40 feet tall and 100 feet wide, extending for 1,000 miles on both sides of the river. Well, according to the levees only theory, you wanted actually to increase the water in the river because the more water in the river, the faster the current is going to move, which is true. And the faster the current was going to move, then the more it was going to scour out the bottom of the river, which is also true. The problem is it's not going to increase the scour enough to accommodate the enormous increase in water in a great flood. There was great hubris involved when you think of these engineers just standing on the banks of the river and looking at its great hydraulic forces and believing that they could control it. There was great confidence in the levee system. The Corps really felt the river was under control and shackled, in effect. In August of 1926, the rains began. They lasted for eight months. The river rose to record heights. The levees trembled when you walked on them. The workers knew it was hopeless, but there was nothing else to do but fight. Will Percy. The water was 
near the top of the levees for a long period of time. So everyone was in a state of, of quite a bit of agitation because no one knew where the levee might fail. The first great break in the levees came on April 21st, 1927, and the best estimates are that there were about 120 breaks before the flood ended. When there's a break, it's not simply the water flowing over the top of the levee as if it were overflowing a bathtub. What you get is tremendous turbulence, unbelievable forces at work, and the river will gouge out a hole in the earth. It will just take acres of the riverbank in one shot. You know, the 1927 flood was two stories. It was man against nature, but it was also man against man. A week after the first major levee break, the flood was moving full force toward New Orleans. The city fathers decided that they would never, under any circumstances, allow the river to threaten the city. So what they did was decide to dynamite the levee about 13 miles below the city and flood out their neighbors. The rural parish of St. Bernard would be sacrificed to the floodwaters to save the city of New Orleans. For a day or two, it looked like the Civil War. For the angry farmers guarding their dikes with shotguns to the battle cry of to hell with New Orleans. Nevertheless, the dikes were cut. Four thousand people were made homeless. The St. Bernard Boys. The turmoil ceased and a great quiet settled down. Cattle, which had not reached the levee, had been drowned. Those in one-story houses had taken to the roofs and the trees. Over everything was silence deadlier because of the strange, cold sound of the currents, gnawing at foundations, hissing against walls, creaming and clawing over obstructions. Will Percy. Robert Hoover is the person who coordinates the federal relief activities in the Mississippi area. And what he does is bring in both federal, local, state governments and help to coordinate them, as well as private agencies like the Red Cross, to find a way to help deal with the refugee problem and to help build up the region after the disaster. Hoover was an organizational genius. He knew how to cut red tape, he knew how to get things done, and well in advance he would get predictions of where levees might break, and he would send orders to a local Red Cross committee and set up 
a refugee camp for 15,000 people. There is a solution to every engineering problem. And no matter what the cost of flood control, it will not be nearly so much as the loss suffered as a result of this flood, which has rendered hundreds of thousands of good citizens homeless and destitute. Herbert Hoover. Man must not try to restrict the Mississippi too much in extreme floods. The river will break any plan that does this. It must have the room that it needs, and to accord with its nature, must have the extra room laterally. General Edgar Jadwin. Jadwin was the chief of engineers at this time, and he visited the lower Mississippi Valley on a number of occasions with uh, Herbert Hoover. And it was he that crafted the comprehensive plan for flood control in the lower Mississippi Valley. The central part of the plan would be the creation of floodways, outlets that would allow the river to flow onto the land at critical points. During flood season and high water, this new approach would, in theory, reduce the pressure on the levee system and keep the river under control. In Congress, Jadwin's new plan ran into stiff opposition from Western senators. They were still trying to convince their colleagues from the South to support the dam on the Colorado. Southern senators bitterly opposed the dam as a wasteful gift of public money to the West. Without a compromise, neither bill would pass. What followed was a great wave of political backscratching. And in the back rooms, the senators made a deal. Both bills became law. The two projects are a convenient way of looking at the shift that, that we will see uh, increasingly in the 20th century as the federal government takes on uh, more responsibility for planning public projects and helping to finance them. Herbert Hoover represented what many people called the new era, a belief in progress, a belief in economic prosperity, and a belief in technology. He was called the great engineer when he ran for president in 1928. I don't think there's any doubt but that the 27 flood made Herbert Hoover president of the United States. He believed in the media, and he had a tremendous press operation. Not that he didn't, he did a great job in the flood. But he made sure that his name was on the front pages every day. In the middle of the flood, he turned to a friend and said, I shall be the nominee. It's nearly inevitable. I think it's not unlikely that when river engineers from the Mississippi Valley visit Hoover Dam, they may feel a bit uh, jealous when they see that deep granite canyon where a dam could be a place that would in effect regulate the river. In the case of the Mississippi, it was not possible to regulate the river with dams or other kinds of impounding structures. So the challenge of the engineers was to kind of work with the forces of the river. Under the Jadwin plan, the Corps focused on the lower Mississippi Valley, where floods inundated the land on a regular basis. The Corps built floodways that would allow the river to flow onto the land, at New Madrid, Missouri, at the Atchafalaya River, and at Bonnie Carey, Louisiana. This system would reduce pressure on the main stem of the Mississippi by providing additional outlets into the Gulf of Mexico. 
In December 1928, the Corps began construction of Bonnie Carey Spillway, 30 miles north of New Orleans. The 7,000-foot-long structure was completed in December 1936. A few weeks later, unrelenting rain set into motion one of the worst floods on record. As the flood came downriver, the Corps opened the concrete gates of the Bonnie Carey Spillway. Floodwaters were diverted into Lake Pontchartrain, taking pressure off the levees, protecting New Orleans. By 1937, many of the levees had been raised and strengthened. No levees on the lower Mississippi failed during the 1937 flood, nor have any failed since. Working on a system as dynamic and as large as the Mississippi River, one can't know everything that there is to know about it. I don't think it's practicable to have a long-range plan for the Mississippi that wouldn't have to be revised repeatedly as conditions change and as the river changes. In the lower part of the river in primordial times, there were a number of smaller streams that were removing water away from the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Old River was one of the last remaining locations where this was occurring, and over time it became apparent that the Atchafalaya River was trying to capture the Mississippi River, that the Mississippi would change its course and find a steeper alternate route to the sea. The possibility of capture of the Mississippi by the Atchafalaya was very real and could just not be allowed to happen. New Orleans and all of the industrial complex below Baton Rouge would have been deprived of a fresh water supply and dependable access uh, for ocean-going commerce, and the economic impacts would have been extremely severe. Congress ordered the Corps to keep the Mississippi in its course. The decision to control flows at Old River was a major decision, and it required that you, in, in essence, take Mother Nature on. A wall was constructed in what had previously been a gap in the levee system at Old River. And in that wall, several valves were placed. And those valves could be opened or closed and would allow engineers to determine just how much water would or would not flow from the Mississippi to the Atchafalaya. Old River control structure was finished in 1959. Work continued on the flood control plan. More than 1,600 miles of levees were raised and strengthened. The river's channel was deepened. Giant concrete mats lined the river bottom to prevent erosion. And the keystone of the flood control plan the system of spillways and floodways was complete. The newest spillway, Morganza, built a mile from the river, would redirect the Mississippi's floodwaters into the Atchafalaya Basin, 30 miles south of Old River. In 1973, Morganza was opened during the worst flood in a quarter century. Bonnie Carey Spillway was also opened. The Corps was successful in protecting every major city along the river. Never before had such a large flood been passed out to sea with so little damage. A 
But at Old River, the Mississippi was winning the battle. I was in my office, and a fisherman drove up. He said, is that south wall supposed to be moving like that? I, I said, what you mean? He says, on the control structure, he said, a wall on the other side is moving. I said, no, it's not supposed to be moving. It would shake to a point that you were absolutely concerned about the safety of being on, on that structure. Now, this is a massive concrete structure that's over 100 feet long and, and has piling that go 100 feet deep underneath it, and yet we had this kind of vibration from the water passing through it. The old river structure did keep the Mississippi from changing course, but just barely. The river's turbulent water scoured an enormous hole beneath the structure. While Old River still operates today, it was too severely battered to fight the river alone. An entirely new structure was built nearby to help support it. This auxiliary structure was the last major project built on the lower Mississippi in the 20th century. I was asked when I was testifying before Congress about the auxiliary structure at Old River. Uh, if this improvement would be all that was ever needed there. And, and my reply was, no, sir. And, and the next question was, well, what will be the next thing? I said, I don't know. But with the system that we're living in out here, there will be something and that, that you can count on and that you must ever be ready for. decade of the 20th century, floods overwhelmed the upper Mississippi Valley. Unlike the lower Mississippi, it had no comprehensive flood protection plan. As in the past, on our nation's rivers, America's politicians and engineers are being challenged to find solutions. To learn more about engineering and public works, visit PBS online at pbs.org. <laughs>